Luke chapter 15, I'm going to start at verse 11. You're welcome to stand if you can, but I've got a handful of verses I intend to read. Luke 15, starting at verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, he there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he had came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Amen. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, God, for uh, the beauty of what we can see in this word and what we probably all already know about this text. And I thank you, God, that you are a great father, that you're awesome and really good and compassionate toward us, God. I thank you that... You never quit on us. I thank you that you run to us when we don't deserve it. I thank you that you have laid down that fatted calf. I could exhaust what I'm thankful for, God, but we just bless your name tonight. Lord, I'm asking that you would uh, do, as I always request, that you would begin to do spiritual, I guess, surgery in hearts and minds tonight, that we would consider and think upon what it is I believe that you've given me to, to bring tonight. I'm asking God that you begin to to... Do a mighty work God, that, that makes us effective, that we would go forth from this place, that we wouldn't just grow individually, but that we would grow in such a way in the kingdom that we could cause others to encounter Jesus. And I'm asking God that you have liberty in every respect in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Y'all can be seated. Now, in the story of the prodigal, which we've heard uh, countless times, each of us, I would say, in a few different ways. Uh, we hear two sons and a father. And traditionally, the story is told in a way that illustrates the heart of the father, who in this text represents God. Yes. While it tells us of a grace that is experienced by a son that clearly didn't deserve it, that was living crazy. But I don't believe that that's the approach that the Lord wants to take with this text tonight. Um, the Lord has given me a thought to consider, and I, I would ask that you bear with me. Uh, I may come off to you as a bit of a broken record, but folks, I'm just going to tell you now in advance that these particular topics, you can count on being as unto a broken record, because without us getting a hold of these issues, these things that I'm going to present to you, then we will never consistently live like Jesus. Amen. We might every now and then manifest what Christ would look like in this world just because we're saved and his spirit is in us. But if we want to consistently walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, pray like Jesus, get the results Jesus might get, then there's some things that are going to have to be said and done and considered in our life. But God gave me a, a, a thought process with this text. And I don't know how I never really saw it that way before. And to be honest, I've not seen it anywhere under this thought process before. 
But I do believe it's crucial that we consider it and begin to apply it. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, it's a verse that we're all probably familiar with as well. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now the word heart in that text can literally mean soul, will, or mind. That's not what we would typically view the heart as. But in that text, in best context, it's referring to the mind. But to go a little deeper, it's referring to the subconscious mind. So the Lord deposited this idea into my spirit. And I want to share it with you. Because the Bible says to regard no man according to the flesh. And as I began to consider this text through a uh, more spiritual lens, as I began to think about what it was God was showing me in this story of the prodigal, it helped me to gain an understanding of uh, the content of what I'm fixing to tell you and how it is that I could rightly divide it and overcome the issues of the prodigal, if I can put it that way. But first, in the text, what I see is a son. I see a son who at one point in time is lost. I see a son at another point in time who is found. I see a son who's at home, while at other times I see a son who is a long way off. But secondly, and this is the point that I believe God wants to address. I'm trying to take it very slow. Y'all know how, how I can get. I see the son in two different estates that I feel like we need to think about. I see a son in rags and poverty, away from his father's house, getting into things that he shouldn't, thinking and doing things that he shouldn't, going places and being a part of things that maybe he shouldn't and finding himself in situations that maybe he shouldn't. But I also see on the flip side of that coin, a son that's restored to righteousness and royalty, a son that uh, is restored all that he has lost, his inheritance and all of the sort, his position, he's received back into the family. I see both. So I say that without any further ado, if we can, for lack of any or any other way to put it that I can think of, I'd like to speak to you tonight regarding the two minds of the believer. The prodigal mind, also known as the carnal mind, or the mind of Christ, also known as the renewed mind. In Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7, and y'all can follow with me in any of these verses you would like because it is good to see it with your own eyes. But in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7, it reads, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Notice how it's worded. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, which really in context is saying, do think on. So they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now remember in verse 24 of our text, it says, For this my son was dead and is alive again. So we see here that there's a son that was dead while he was away from the father's house. And through the spiritual lens that I intend to take tonight, I, that I believe that the Lord would have us to think on this text through, he was dead while he was living as a son through the carnal mind. The Bible says that the carnal mind is at enmity with, with God. It is hostile to the things of God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. And when I look at the story of the prodigal, of course I see grace. I see love. I see an awesome father. I see restoration. I see undeserved merit. I see things that doesn't 
that, that the world would say there's no reason you should treat that son that way. I see all those things, but ultimately when I look at this story now that the Lord has shown me this perspective, what I see is two ways of thinking. I see the sons of God, I see the people of God for that matter, with the ability to think one of two ways. And depending on how it is you choose to think and which mind it is you choose to function out of, the end result of what your life will produce might produce something similar to that of the prodigal. And whether it be physical sin, running off from home and going and doing dope or whatever it was he was doing, whether it be sin in the flesh, whether it be that or just ways of thinking, which is really what I think God wants to address, either way it's going to leave you in a place that, that ultimately your thought processes, your actions, your words cannot line up with that of Jesus Christ. And ultimately you're functioning out of a, out of a place that is at enmity with God. The carnal mind... Is this is underemphasized in the church. And I believe I've heard, as I've said before, hundreds of too many messages of preachers telling the church why it is they're not walking in power or victory. And it's coming from a man not walking in power or victory. And I'm here to tell you right now, folks, that you can beg and plead God all you want for something you already have, and it's not going to change your circumstance. And you're not going to walk in more power. You're not going to walk in more victory. None of that's going to happen just because you beg God for something that you've already got. Odds are you've already got the tools that it is that it's going to take to live the way Jesus wants you to live. The, the answer rests upon your way of thinking. The answer rests upon which mind is it that you're functioning out of. Because you've got a choice to make. A house divided cannot stand. You can't be double-minded and expect to function like Christ functioned. You've got a carnal mind that was given to you to brush your teeth and to drive your car home. It was given to you for that reason, but it was never given to you for the reason to lay hands on the sick or to minister the gospel. That's why people, they lay hands on folks and there's nothing, there's no manifestation. They don't feel the power of God. They don't get delivered. When things are taking place in the spiritual with the church, most times you'll see a, a huddle around a person. 15, 20 people come to the prayer line. They leave the way they came. It's not because they're not born again. It's not because they weren't talking in tongues 20 minutes before that, the evidence of having the baptism. None of that. It's because they're not thinking out of the correct mind and therefore cannot produce what they're called to produce. Amen. So what I see in the carnal mind, and I'm just going to give it to you very simple, is, is I see a poor perspective right out of the gate who the father is. That the son goes to the father and you see that he doesn't have a good grip as to who the father is and therefore he leaves the father's house. He has a poor perspective of the nature and the heart of the father. But you'll see throughout the actions and the choices of the prodigal a lot of self-service, a lot of things for him, his own interest with disregard to the interests of others. You'll see a lot of sinful desires. You'll see a lot of carnal desires. You'll see a lot of desires that are not in consistency with kingdom desires. You'll see a lot of lack. You'll see a lot of things missing. You'll see a lot of things not producing fruit in his life. You'll see a lot of issues in that respect. And here's one I want to hit the nail on the head with this hammer for a reason. You'll see a lot of unworthiness. And he speaks it on the way home. I'm not worthy to be called thy son. And I say that because most of the church doesn't understand what sonship looks like. And thinks that after the blood of Jesus Christ has come that some way, somehow they're still unworthy. Amen. That's the carnal mind. That's the mind that does not produce the righteousness of God, the power of God, or the things of Jesus Christ. Folks, let me tell you something. If, if the Father is well pleased with Jesus and you've been made one with Him and as He is, so are you in this world. Is He well pleased with you or not? Bless the Lord. You see in this carnal mind estate, this place where He's not in the Father's house, you see a servant mindset over a sonship mindset. The, a son and a servant differ not according to the Bible except in a few respects. But ultimately what it is is he's placing himself in a position lower than he belongs. And the church does this continually. They feel like by debasing themselves and putting themselves down low that by some way, somehow, that, that's a high thing. And that's not the mindset of Jesus Christ. That's not the mindset of a son. That's not the mindset of an heir. It's certainly not the mindset of a king. It's certainly not the mindset of a priest. It's certainly not the mindset. Amen. You see in this carnal minded mindset that the son has, he had a, a poverty mindset rather than an abundant flow of kingdom mindset. You see, you see broke, poor, pitiful, blind and naked is what you see in his mindset. You see things that are not in consistency with the mind of Christ. Romans chapter 12, 
Verse 2, it's a few pages over from where you currently are. It says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I've heard that, literally heard somebody teach that as to mean, be not conformed to the world, meaning don't dress like the world. Don't watch what the world watches. And I get that. Don't be a partaker with the world. But that is not what this text is saying. Do not be conformed to their way of thinking. Don't have the mindset that the world has. Don't think the way that the world has. Don't fix your mind on the thing that the world does. Because what you fix your mind on is what your life will produce. Amen. But it goes on to say, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That suggests to me a couple of things. It suggests to me first that you're not transformed until your mind is renewed. So how do you get regenerated when the blood comes but you're not transformed? Because that tells, that tells me a lot, folks, that a man can be saved but yet to be transformed. That he can be washed in the blood but something is not transformed yet. And I'm here to tell you right now that it's the seed of the soul which is the mind. I'm here to tell you right now it's where that rests right now and it's in the mind. That do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. For what reason? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 reads that you put off concerning the former conversation. The word conversation, again, is not just words, but it's your entire way of living. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. See, there's this, this old man is the carnal minded man. This is the man that we are to be the, the put off. It's the one that we are to get rid of and not think from. It's the one we are not to lay hands on the sick from and pray for. Look, folks, the carnal minded man, let me tell you what he does when he goes to pray for the sick. He goes to pray for the sick. He says, look, now, I'm going to pray with you. I know that God is able and I'm going to agree with you. But, you know, it may or may that that's the carnal mind. And what it's doing is presenting a safety net so that you have self-preservation so that if nothing happens, you're not looking silly when nothing changes. That's the carnal mind. The carnal mind lays hands on the sick and says, well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I'm not really sure. Or the carnal mind goes another step further and says, how would that happen? How if I grab them by the hand and pull on them? Are they ever going to come out of that wheelchair? All of these things, these are reasoning. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's that logic that comes from the wrong tree. That comes from the wrong mind. And by thinking through that mind and thinking through that tree that you have no business eating from, by functioning through that place, you will not produce Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. To put off that former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. Folks, it's as bad as God says it is bad. Enmity against God, hostile against the things of God. It cannot be subject to the laws of God. And the problem is to, to renew your mind. Let me tell you what it really means in the Greek. And I challenge everybody here to study this one. Now, what it does not mean is I open this book and I get so familiar with it and I can quote it really well. That I've beat my carnal mind into submission and now it does what I want it to do. That will never happen. It cannot be subject to the laws of God. With the carnal mind being what to renew the mind, biblically speaking, in the original context is for me to simply accept what God said as fact and believe it. Therefore, when I go to lay hands on the sick, and I use this as an example because it's the easiest example. And when I lay hands on the sick, Questions begin to come in. What if, what if? I say, no, not today, sir. No, sir. You're a carnal mind. You're an atheist. You're at enmity against God. You sit over there in the corner and hang out while I do spiritual things in the mind of Christ. I am not taking advice from you. So when I go lay hands on the sick and the questions come, I shut them off. And I say, God said so, so it is. I don't have to know how they're going to walk when I pull them out of that chair. I don't have to know how in the world that's going to happen when I go to pray for them. I don't have to understand that. God said so, so it is. Amen. Folks, my concern, and I say this, is because the bulk of what happens in the church today is carnal minded. I'm telling you without a shadow of a doubt, I'll, I'll, I'll stake everything on this. That for sure, that is the ultimate reason the church is not walking in power. That is the ultimate reason the church is not walking in victory. That is the ultimate reason the church is not changing her generation. Because they think they lack some good thing when God says you lack no good thing. They think that they need more Holy Ghost when God said you're a partaker of my divine nature. 
They think that they don't have an inheritance when God says it's abiding in you already. They think they can't walk in the kingdom when God says the kingdom is in you and you have the keys to it. Oh, glory. It's already there. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you don't get results in walking this Christian life out, I challenge you to try what I'm telling you. Quit begging God for more and start believing that he's already given it to you. Stop asking him for things that you already have and start walking in it by putting off the carnal mind and renewing your mind. I'm telling you, when you believe this book, you say, God, I do not have to understand it. That's why a child can enter into the kingdom. I don't have to understand necessarily what, how it's going to work out or the behind the scenes things that the spirit of God's going to do. I just have to accept it as fact and receive it and make it mine. Bless the Lord. But folks, when this prodigal begins to head home, I begin to see once he gets there and some things begin to get ironed out. And we can call the journey home a renewal process, even though, again, there's really no renewal process. The only process is figuring out how to just accept the word. I'm not beating my mind into submission a little bit at a time. It's just taking me time to figure out how to be settled on what God said. But I see once he gets there that the father in his goodness begins to restore some things. He begins to give him some things. And I'm going to tell you right now, it happens because of the blood of the fatted calf. It does not happen for any other reason. That God lays down, or the father in this case, lays down that fatted calf, the spot-free, blemish-free, wrinkle-free, fatted calf, lays him down as a sacrifice for the sins of the son. He does not pardon him without reason. False religions will tell you today that that father would bring him home. There would be no fatted calf. There would be no blood. And he restores him anyway because of just his good outweighing his bad. And that's not so. That a good father had provision for his sin. He comes home. The blood is shed. He's accepted. But at that point, the father begins to restore unto him things that are beyond measure. And I want to discuss those things with you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let there be no mistake about it. 5 and 6 for that matter. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Think about that. When you speak to people about the gospel or when you pray for folks, is it the mind of Christ? Does it sound like something Jesus would say? Does it look like something Jesus would do? I know I ain't here necessarily to preach tonight, but I will teach you something that if you apply it, it will change you. Amen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. The first few years of my salvation, thanks to religion and a lot of traditions that aren't healthy, when I would go on the streets and minister to people because I loved Jesus and was on fire for Him, I just wasn't thinking correctly. I would go out and I would begin to pray for people. I'd say, God, I thank you for this person. I know, God, that you're able to bring change here, God. If you would, by chance, step down off your throne and enter into this position so that you can do a work, God. I know I'm feeble and helpless. I'm not able to help them. I don't have the tools to do it. But you can, God. We know you can. But I certainly can't. I was praying prayers like that and nothing ever changed. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. When he walked up to somebody, he said, be thou made whole. When they brought the fishes and the bread, he didn't begin to raise questions. He just thanked God and blessed his name. And there was provision. Amen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When the leper came, he didn't say, God, I don't know really what we're going to do here. Maybe if five or six of us get together and we, we pray in tongues long enough, then something will break. No, he didn't do that. He said, be thou made clean now. When the person of faith came along and said, I've got somebody sick at the house and, and I'm thinking maybe uh, you could get them healed. He's like, okay, let's go. Let's go to your house. He said, no, you just speak the word right now and it'll be done. What did he do? He didn't raise questions and ask God to step down and come in and intervene and do something for him. He did it because he knew who he was and what he had. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he didn't think it was wrong to be a son of God. He didn't think it was wrong to fully embrace what the blood accomplished. He didn't think it was wrong to walk in this kingdom the way that the Father intends for him to walk in it. What would be wrong, what would be robbery if he said, look, I accept the blood, I accept forgiveness, but I do not accept your authority. I do not accept your power. I do not accept the ring, the robe, or the shoes. I don't accept any of that because I'm carnally minded, unworthy. I don't want that. The calf, maybe I can get on board with that. I accept the forgiveness, but the rest of it, no, that's robbery. 
If nobody's ever told you, that's robbing God. That is not the mind of Christ. And the function absent of the mind of Christ is robbery of God. Amen. The renewed mind we see when he returns home has a better perspective of who the Father is because the Father demonstrated His love. If not for the demonstration of the Father's love, He would probably still have a skewed perspective. But we begin to see kingdom living and and, and the the instances of self-service begin to go away. The desire for sin is a non-issue. You don't hear about it anymore when He comes home. When He begins thinking out of that renewed mind. When he puts on the mind of Christ, you hear no more about sin or falling away or anything of the sort. It goes away. Amen. When he gets home, he's restored completely. He lacks no good thing. You hear no more about lack. You hear no more like the church often likes to pray. Well, God, I I don't know how this is going to come to pass. I don't know how that's going to come to pass. I need this or I need that. I don't know what to do. But they don't pray like that. And he didn't function like that. He knew that he had all of the resources of heaven in his father's house. He might not have had it in his pocket, but he knew because of the mind that was in him that he had it to his disposal. And again, I want to harp on this just for a second that when he came home, I guarantee you when he had that ring on his hand and those shoes on his feet and that robe on him, I guarantee you that he did not any longer feel like he was unworthy to be a son. I guarantee you that after he saw the Father demonstrate his love, laid down that fatted cap, the blood was shed, all of these things were restored unto him. It didn't take him long to stop feeling unworthy. Amen. But as long as he's home in the Father's house and he's still thinking like the man down the road that's in sin, he will continue to feel unworthy. He will continue to feel like he's got lack. He will continue to not function like God would function or think like God would think. He will continue in that estate. Amen. Folks, I don't know if I gave this analogy before to you all, but I'm going to do it quickly again. I have. And I'm going to do it again anyway. When I started the job that I'm working years ago, I started at a, as a warehouse guy. That's all I did was pull orders and stock shelves, clean the place. That's what I did. And I was fortunate to have that with the charges that I have. Um, and there came a point in time in which they put me in a new position to manage shipping, receiving, and the warehouse. So my position changed. I was elevated to a higher place. The problem was is the day before I'm working alongside of people that now I have charge over. So it was hard for me to, to make requests say, I need you to do this or I need you to clean that or I need you to go there. It was not easy for me because 24 hours before that, we were on the same level. Right. But I concluded and the Lord used that My work condition to show me things of the kingdom and to bring me into position at work. That look, you're doing harm to the man above you that owns the place. To those that are co-equal to you right now. And to those that are below you by not functioning out of your position. In other words, by not thinking out of the renewed mind. We're only doing damage to the rest of the church. To those that are not saved yet. And we're really not doing the father any favors. So I got to a place in which I said, you know what? Let's do it. I tell the truck driver, I said, hey man, I need you to make a stop. And sometimes they would fight against it a little because they remembered who I was. But I had to say, look, you're going to do it. I need you to do it. Make it happen. Now we don't have those issues anymore. But the point is, when I began to function out of my position, we've been seated with Christ. We have a new position now. And when I began to think like somebody that was in a new position. I was able to function like somebody that was in a new position. I could not exercise my authority, my power, my, my responsibilities, any of the things that had been given to me in my new position. I could not function in while I was still thinking like a warehouse guy. Amen. So when I began to think like a manager, I began to function like a manager. And that's the problem with the church right now. Is that we've been given a new position by the blood of Jesus in Christ, elevated to a high place, seated in heavenly places with Him. But most of us are still thinking like somebody that's not been raised. We're still thinking like somebody that's unworthy, pitiful, poor. We're still thinking like somebody that's broke and has lack. We're still thinking like somebody that does not have the answer to our issue. We're still thinking like somebody that doesn't know what to do about things when they come our way. When the enemy fires off arrows, we don't know how to handle it. When the enemy lies in our ear, we don't know how to handle it. When our kid gets sick, we don't know what to do about it. We drag them first thing to the ER without praying first. And I'm not against doctors, but my goodness, why are we not praying first? 
because we don't know who we are or what we have. The moment the church begins to think on things above, position her mind where she's seated with Christ in heavenly places, she will begin to function just exactly like Jesus functioned and greater according to his words. Amen. So I see two minds here, church, and we've got a choice to make. We can carry on positioned in a great place, thinking like those that are not positioned there. Well, we can decide once and for all that we're going to function like people that have been positioned with Christ, in Christ, in heavenly places. So in Proverbs 23, 7, where it said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And we determine that the word heart there ultimately is referring to the mind or even furthermore, the subconscious mind. You've got to know that if you don't take control of what comes into your conscious mind, if you don't take dominion over your own conscious Mind, then whatever it is that is influencing your conscious mind is eventually going to deposit into your subconscious mind. And that's the heart. That's the one that Proverbs is talking about. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As you think in that heart. So whatever comes through the conscious mind will eventually go into the subconscious mind. And that is what your life is going to produce. I know you don't hear a lot of that, but that's why a lot of things aren't changing. So how do you reconcile that? What do you do with it? I don't know. I've said this so many times until I'm blue in the face. Titus says you affirm continually. The Apostle Peter says you escape the corruption that's in the world through lust by the promises. I'm a son of God. I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm an heir of the throne. I'm bought with a price. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the salt of the earth and the light of the world. I'm telling you that as I say these things over my life, all the time and continually, before you know it, my conscious mind will receive so much of it, it's going to settle down into the heart Proverbs is talking about, and that is the life that I will live. Amen. But if I spend my day saying I'm pitiful, I don't know how I'm going to get by. I'm just hanging on until the trumpet blasts. I'm just barely making it. I'm just clawing my way through life. And you better know that that's what my life's going to look like. That I'm going to barely make it. That I'm going to claw my way through life. That until the trumpet blast comes, that I'm just going to be worn out and beat down by the enemy. But if I choose this day to say, you know what? I know what he paid for. And I'm going to walk like a king. I'm going to walk like a priest. And in order to do so, I'm going to renew my mind. I'm going to put off that carnal way of thinking, that prodigal way of thinking. And I'm going to think like one who's been bought with a price. I'm going to think like one who's been washed in the blood. I'm going to think like one who has authority and power. Look at the ring on my hand. I'm going to think like one who has a robe of righteousness on, who's been made the righteousness of God. I'm going to think like one who's not a servant but has the shoes of sonship now. I'm going to think like a king. I'm going to think like Jesus. Amen. Philippians 4 8 says, finally. Brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Why do you suppose God says to think on those things? Because he knows the fruit that it will produce. He knows what it will do in your life as you obey what God said here, as you put into practice these things. As you meditate on things above and fix your mind on things above where Christ is seated and where you're seated with him. As you fix your mind on those things, you will produce Jesus Christ in and through your life. Colossians 3, 1 through 3 says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. In other words, fix your mind on the things of the Father's house. Fix your mind on what it looks like to be restored, a king and a priest washed in the blood. Fix your mind on those things. Forget those things which are behind you. Forget those things that you did when you were out in poverty, when you were out living like a prodigal, when you were out living wastefully and riotously. Forget about those things and fix your mind on these things. Think on these things and you will produce those things. So in context... God's not. I want to rewind. Isaiah 55, and I would encourage you to go here because this is a very, very popular text. 
And it's most of the time it's misapplied. Isaiah 55, we'll start at verse 7. Isaiah 55, verse 7 and 8. It says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Now, folks, I'm telling you in, in exact context to what this text is really saying. First of all, God is not talking to the righteous man. He is talking to the unrighteous man. And I see people say, well, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways. And they, they shout hallelujah to that text, not realizing that God was never talking to you that are righteous by the blood of Jesus. Amen. So God is not talking to the righteous man when he says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. But either way, the solution to this thinking issue that we see here and the breaking off of the carnal mind is, is rather simple. To break away from this prodigal thinking and to start thinking like a son of God who's seated in heavenly places, you got to believe what God has said about you. You got to understand what you possess because of the blood. You got to understand what you have abiding within you already. You got to understand what was purchased for you and what it cost the one that bought it. Amen. You got to understand why it is you've been made a partaker and what that really looks like for you. So Isaiah 55 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. That's who we're talking to right now. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 2, just real quick, 10 through 16. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting at verse 10. I'm going to start at the Spirit searcheth, the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Amen. Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Right. What are you saying, Lord? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Amen. That we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak not in the words which, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. But the natural man, the carnal man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. I don't know if you got a hold of that. But in a nutshell, because you have the mind of Christ and the Spirit of the Lord in you, His ways and His, His thoughts do not have to be higher than your ways and your thoughts. In fact, what God would have for you is that you be elevated in your mind by mind renewal to function out of the mind of Christ so that your ways are His ways and so that your thoughts are His thoughts. He does not want you living like an unrighteous man anymore, thinking the thoughts that the unrighteous do and producing the words and the actions that the unrighteous do. That is not the will of God for the church, that we abide in prodigalism and in prodigal thinking, but that we would come home and receive what the blood has bought for us, the ring and the robe and the shoes, and that we would begin to think like God thinks, walk like God walks, speak like God walks, pray like God would pray, do the things God would do. 
Folks, because we've got the mind of Christ, we've been given the power to become the sons of God, the Bible says. That's right. That means we're to think like a king through the mind of Christ. Have this mind which was in you. To think like an heir, like Christ would think. Or to think like somebody with authority. To think like somebody with power. To think like somebody that knows how to cast down imaginations that try to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Colossians 3, 10 and 11 says, and have put on the new man, the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. If it's renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, then I would suggest to you that if that's the mind you're functioning out of, then your ways and your thoughts are pretty consistent with the one that created you. But it is not absent of the, the mind of Christ. It is not found in prodigal thinking. It is not found as you, even though you're washed in the blood, your mind is still down here in the gutter. It is not found with you thinking I'm pitiful, I'm unworthy, I'm broke, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not fit for the kingdom. I'm just barely this and that. That is not the mind of Christ, church. I don't know how else to put it. Galatians 4, 7 says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. But we come home and we continue to think like a servant. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Even the gospel ship calls us heirs. Galatians 3, 29 says, And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And folks, heirs have power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. They got power over all power of the enemy. Church, the Father commended His love towards you that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Look at what manner the Father had, what kind of love He had towards you that He would bestow upon you that you should be called the sons of God. Amen. Think about that. The prophet Isaiah says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Folks, that's about all I know what to tell you. It's plain and simple. You get bought with the price by the blood of Jesus. You get brought back into the Father's house. And you can very well put on these things, this ring and the robe and the shoes, but it ain't going to do you any good like it didn't do me any good at work if you continue to think like a prodigal, if you continue to think like one that's still out in the sin, if you continue to think like one that ain't worthy to walk like Jesus and walk with Jesus, if you continue to think like one that doesn't have all of His needs supplied according to the riches and glory of God, if you continue to think like one that doesn't know where His help comes from, that doesn't know who His source is, if you continue to think like one that can't walk like Jesus walked, even though the Bible says you lack no good thing, and that as He is, so are you in this world. If you continue to think like one that is not the salt of the earth or the light of the world, or if you continue to think like one that is not an ambassador of Christ, or the aroma of Christ, or a royal priesthood, or a son of God, if you continue to think like one like that, you will not produce what you have inherited. But if by chance you say, God, I don't understand how all of this came to pass. When I look in the mirror, I see wrinkles. When I look in the mirror, I see ugly. When I look in the mirror, the devil says failure. When I look in the mirror, I see a lot of things that don't line up with what your book seems to be saying. When we believe that God says, as you are right now, as he is, so are you in this world. Then when we begin to believe what Jesus said, we can begin to function as Jesus functioned. I've told you this once before, folks, but the epistles in this book were written to the the church. They weren't written to the lost man. They weren't written to the unsaved. They were written to you and I that's washed in the blood of Jesus. But the word for glass there, that we look into a glass darkly, the word for glass is each soptron in the Greek, and it means mirror. Folks, tell me, please tell me that when you go to the mirror in the bathroom in there and you look in it, that you look 25 if you're 70. Or when you go in there and you, you begin to, and you're a white person, you look black. Come on, seriously. No, when I look in Ephesians chapter 1 and it says that I'm an heir, that I'm seated in heavenly places, that I have a treasure in an earthen vessel, that I've been bought with the price, I have no choice and if I want to live like Jesus to believe it when God says it even though I've got a migraine or even though my back hurts or even though the day of work that I had didn't go well. If I choose to believe that what God said is true, then I will function as Jesus Christ functioned. Amen. 
What's bad is much of this is foreign language to much of the church. And it's basic, basic kingdom principles. Yes, sir. My kids, every one of them, and I say this and I'm allowed to say it because I'm a son of God, will all be laying hands on the sick by the time they're double digits. Well, how can you say that? It's up to God. I'm a son of God. How can you say that? It's up to God. I have a ring on my hand. He gave it to me. How can you say that? Because he put a robe on me. I know who I am. How can you say that? Because I'm his ambassador. I'm his representative on earth. He sent me. I have the right as a son to give to them what I've got in the kingdom. And they will walk in it. I will not teach them religion. I will not raise them in the doctrines and commandments of men. They will walk in power and victory. They will change the little kids at daycare or wherever they go. When they go to ride the swing at the park and they see somebody that's got hurt, they're going to raise them up. They're going to get well. It's going to happen. Right now, my five-year-old has healed more sick people than most folks in the church. Under my authority. She's not even saved yet. Wrap that one around your carnal mind. If I'm a co-heir with Christ and I can function under His authority... Then tell me why somebody can't function under his authority through me. If I'm a son of God, an ambassador of Christ, how come I can't divvy out what he's divvied to me? Or can I? Why do you suppose you've never heard me ask God to step down and do something for me when I prayed for the sick? If you went to become a cop right now, they gave you a gun and a badge and a car. And you're sitting down here on the side of the parkway radar and making sure nobody's doing over 35 by Bojangles. And I go by and I do 78 because I want to get home in a hurry. And rather than arrest me, write me a ticket, and probably take my license, you say, hey, dispatch, guess what? Somebody's doing 78 and a 35. You think maybe you could come down here and do something about it? You, you think you could come down here out of your desk and come down to here to me and, and do this? What do you think would happen? What do you think would happen to me if I called the owner every time I needed a set of tires on a truck? Or I called the owner every time somebody gave me lip instead of dealing with it myself. He would probably put somebody else in my position. And church, I'm telling you, Jesus Christ shed his blood. A son was sown so that many sons could be reaped. That was the purpose of what God was doing. So that Christ could come back on Pentecost and fill many and not just one. But that's the point. He's looking for Jesus in every state, every region, every nation through his body. It doesn't happen through the prodigal carnal mind. He's looking to produce Jesus in your life, in your life, in your life, in your life, everywhere you go. And the mind that was in Christ had this mind that was in him in you. Knows who he is. Knows what he can do. Only does what he sees the Father do. You want to know what the Father does? Look at what Jesus did. You want to know if it's the will of God to heal somebody? Did Jesus get 100%? Did Jesus pray for everybody? He prayed for everybody that came his way. If he didn't do it then, he did it four days later, but he did it. Here's what I have learned, church. Is that most people do a better job of living than me, I think. But most people do not better, do a better job of functioning like Jesus functioned. And I don't say that in pride. I say that because it says to me that anybody under the sound of my voice can do what I do and better. Because from glory to glory, I'm just barely getting by sometimes it seems like. I'm like, God, how in the world am I walking in power and yet feel like an idiot sometimes? Because I have this mind that was in him. In me. Some of you here live more holy than I ever thought about living. But you ain't walking in power. You're not producing what Jesus produced. Have this mind which is in Him, in you. Renew your mind. Believe what God said. Put off the carnal way of thinking. Put off the prodigal mind. Put off that backslidden way of thinking. The sin way of thinking. The lack way of thinking. The I'm broke way of thinking. And think like a son of God. 
Think like a son of God. It will change you. Miss Shirley, I know you know that this is real. She's getting a hold of this. And she'll do it with or without you. She's getting a hold of it. Brother Brandon here, how many people have you healed before you come here? Yeah. Zero. What changed? Somebody told you you could and helped you to demonstrate it? Probably didn't fast more. He probably didn't pray more. Just had a shift in his mind and somebody to take him by the hand and show him how to do it. Simple. It's all in the mind. All day long, it's in the mind. Father, help us. My heart desires to see Jesus manifest in this church and in this world in every possible respect. I'd like to see Sister Nancy walk on water in a couple weeks. Literally. We'd like to see the dead raised just for a testimony of Jesus Christ. Just so the world can say that God is alive. God, I'm asking that you minister to minds and hearts right now so that the people will know that even now, right now, they can do it. Right now, in their current estate, even with things that aren't completely ironed out, they can do it right now. The biggest, one of the biggest lies of the enemy, God, that I see is that he's told the church that, well, sure, you can do it, but it's going to be a while. You've got to get this or that and the other together. God, I know you showed me that right now I'll walk in and we'll iron out the rest later. And I'm asking God that you put it on the hearts of the people. Put it on the church. To go out and step out and just believe you. Just believe what you said. To take five scriptures out of the epistles and make it their own. Speak it over their life until they walk in it, until it's settled. We love you in Jesus' name. I went to raise the dead one time and my mind was a wreck. It didn't work. I want another shot at it. Not with any of y'all. <laughs> but over the years now, I don't bat an eye at pain or physical issues. When we went out on the streets yesterday, this girl said she had knee issues. Was it the day before yesterday? She said she had knee issues. And the church would rebuke me for speaking this way, but I said, here's what's going to happen. He's going to pray for you. Your pain's going to go. It's going to happen. The carnal mind says you cannot talk that way. It is up to God. God already decided on Calvary. Okay? I know the will of God because it was demonstrated in Jesus Christ. So yes, absolutely, I can say it will happen. And I don't say it empty. I say it because I know which mind I'm speaking out of. If I'd have told her I hope so, it probably would have never happened. What are we going to do? Seriously. Everybody content with the current state of your Christianity? I like the things I see in my life. I like seeing people get healed and set free and saved and stuff. It's encouraging. It's, it's like a high like no other. I'm not content with just accepting what I've seen so far and calling that that. Folks, if I'm getting 80% and healing the sick, that's not good enough. If one out of 20 gets saved, that's certainly not good enough. telling you without a shadow of a doubt and I don't say it with pretense that the only issue for me and probably most of you is between your two ears. Amen. I know my cup runneth over. I know I speak with tongues of fire and worship and in prayer all the time. But I did when I wasn't getting results too. Get your mind church. Renew it. Anybody needs prayer, let's do it.